We were just fascinated by what she has to say, and I think you will be today as well. Um, so, uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Jan Holden. Please give her an epic welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I um, began to be involved in studying near-death experiences while I was doing my doctoral dissertation uh, in the mid, a little after the mid-80s. And uh, I've been studying them ever since and uh, have gotten, because I'm a professor, a university professor uh, at University of North Texas, I chair the Department of Counseling and Higher Education and, and I'm actually on the counseling program faculty. And uh, I've gotten involved professionally with the International Association for Near-Death Studies where I've networked and met a lot of near-death experience scholars. And so in 2000, uh, well, as you'll see here in a minute, the, um, the field of near-death studies really opened in 1975. So in 2006, after 30 years had passed, um, a couple of scholars and I decided to um, edit a book that would review all the research that has been done on near-death experiences those first 30 years. And the result was the Handbook of Near-Death Experiences, 30 Years of Investigation. And so uh, my presentation today is actually going to be a sort of summary of the main points of the book. So if you are happy with just hearing the main points, you'll get that today. If you'd like to dig into the background behind the main points, you can buy the book. Um, it's $40 on Amazon now, I think. But uh, I can sell it to you for 30 because I get a, an author's discount. And um, a little later, I'll be reading a little excerpt from the book um, when we start looking at children's near-death experiences. So, and by the way, any um, profits from the book go to the International Association for Near-Death Studies Research Fund. So it's, I'm not profiting personally from, from the book the sale of the book. So my colleagues are Bruce Grayson, who is a psychiatrist at the University of Virginia Medical School, and Debbie James, who is a nurse educator at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. So the three of us cooperated on, on this book. So um, the first chapter, uh-oh, it looks like we lost our remote connection. I'll just... So I'm with the audio. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> um, the first chapter uh, we reviewed the field of near-death studies and um, the probably most important first point is that... Um, whoops! Oh dear, that's not right. Let's see, hang on just a second. I'm not sure what happened there. Okay, let's try this again. All right, so the field did formally open in 1975 with Raymond Moody's book Life After Life. How many of you have read Life After Life? Okay, so you, a lot of this is going to sound familiar because in a nutshell, over 30 years, essentially what Moody reported in that first book has just been confirmed by lots and lots of research. Um, of course, we've refined it in some ways. There's been expansion of what's known, but um, nothing that research since then has established contradicts anything that he found. So if you remember that book, you're gonna, a lot of this is gonna sound familiar. In that book, he noted that descriptions of near-death experiences had occurred throughout history and across cultures. 
and specifically can be found in ancient Egyptian, Tibetan, Greek, and Christian texts. So it's really not anything new. But what happened is that um, resuscitation technology developed over the middle of the 20th century, and by the 1970s, people were being resuscitated from conditions near death in unprecedented numbers in, in human history. And because we had these numbers of people, we could start looking at the experience um, in depth and noticed that, as Moody did, that there's actually a, a basic pattern to the experiences. And that pattern, um, no two near-death experiences are exactly alike, but they, um, every near-death experience will um, involve some aspect of this pattern. And we'll talk about what that pattern is, and you'll actually hear a near-death experiencer talk about her experience and see how it fits. So by 2005, many books had been written, over 700 journal articles, uh, professional peer-reviewed journal articles had been written, including 65 research studies in the US, Europe, Asia, and Australia, involving more than 3,500 near-death experiencers. So it was a good number to uh, base a research review on. And uh, these research studies looked at both the near-death experience itself, the after effects of the experience, or both. So, um, and by the way, if, uh, if you have questions, if you can make a mental or written note of them, because there's a chance that I'll actually answer it as I move along, but then when we get to the end, if there's anything that I haven't answered, we'll have time for lots of question and discussion. So the second chapter, we focused on the phenomenon that has been most studied, and that is pleasurable Western adult near-death experiences, which seems, sounds kind of like a mouthful, but pleasurable means that the experience was dominated by pleasurable feelings like peace, joy, and love. Western means US, Europe, Australia, and adult means people over 18. And um, what we found from um, studying lots and lots of these people is that near-death experiences, just like the title says, occur most often during serious illness or injury, but actually the experience has been reported in a variety of circumstances in which the, um, that I would call extreme. So, of course, if your heart stops beating, that's extreme. But if you're in profound despair, that's extreme, and, and people sometimes have experienced these kinds of experiences then. If you are um, exerting yourself in a um, 20K run, that's extreme, and people sometimes have experiences like this in, in that process. So one doesn't need to be unconscious, but people do have near-death experiences when their physical body is unconscious. Um, so um, it's, it's in a way kind of misnamed near death because people aren't always near death when they have these experiences but what I've concluded is that being near death is probably the single best facilitator of these experiences and NDEs include one or more of these features and this is where we're getting to the pattern that's in the experience first of all it's important to know that near-death experiencers by and large say that the experience was uh, absolutely real or hyper real. So it was as real or more real than this reality. And um, it's kind of hard to imagine how something could be more real than this, but that's what they say. Um, and the ears sometimes say it was realer than real. So their subjective perception is that whatever happened was, um, was real and genuine. And uh, the first thing that typically happens is that the person has a sense of um, their consciousness functioning apart from their physical body. Sometimes people actually have the experience of leaving their body. Sometimes they just suddenly are conscious outside of their body, as is the case with the gal we'll hear in a little while. 
And um, while out of body, the person, um, my doctoral dissertation research was on the nature of visual perception in the out of body state. At the time, we didn't know some fundamental questions like, um, if you're out of your body, does blue look like blue? Does, um, are things recognizable? Can you read? And so what is the nature of visual perception? So in essence, what I found is visual perception is the same as in the physical body, but better. Things look clearer, typically clearer, brighter, and um, the person also has some abilities that they don't have in, when they're in their body. Like they can, wherever they direct their attention, they can see in that direction. So like right now, I can't see my left hand, but if I were out of my body, and if I had a hand, I'd be able to see it just by directing my attention that way. And also, people can both see and see through physical objects like walls. So people can see things that are happening in, uh, re in remote locations, like the next room or the other side of the hospital, let's say, if the person is in the hospital when this happens. So um, in the out-of-body state, the person typically uh, reports that their consciousness was, at, if it happens inside a room, was at the ceiling, usually a ceiling corner of the room, and they're um, looking onto the scene. Uh, people can hear, and also, although there hasn't been a specific study about hearing in the out-of-body state, what people have reported is that they can not only hear what is what we normally can hear, but they also can hear like people's thoughts. So they can hear um, like nurses, what nurses and doctors are thinking and things like that. Like there was a case where a, um, a physician had had, a surgeon had had a car accident on the way to work. And while he was doing surgery, he was slightly preoccupied with the accident and concerned about insurance and things like that. And the, um, during the surgery, the patient had went into cardiac arrest, had a um, a near-death experience and could pick up on the surgeon's um, preoccupation. And then, of course, they resuscitated him, and then after he regained consciousness and the surgeon came around to see how he was doing, he said, you know, I'm doing fine, they got through all that, blah, blah, blah. And then he patted the surgeon on the hand, he said, don't worry, everything's going to be okay with the insurance in your car. And the surgeon was like, what? You know, and he's, well, you know. <laughs> Um, typically, uh, because these are pleasurable experiences, people report that they are feeling um, absolutely at peace, a sense of complete well-being, um, safe, um, and it's uh, often their um, times of ecstasy in the experience, which we haven't gotten to that part yet. But um, like last night, I had an NDE year over for dinner, and we were talking about her experience, and we, she was trying to explain to me what it was like to be out of her body, looking at her body. She knew it was her body. Um, one of the things she thought, she had been in a um, bicycle riding and was hit by a car, and she was sprawled out on the cement. And one of the things she thought was, you know, next time I need to try to assume a more ladylike position when I <laughs> land. And, but her body was um, unconscious. So, um, but she said that it, she wasn't like worried or concerned. She certainly was pain-free, and that's typical, because the person's consciousness really is, they perceive it to be separate from, their, from the body. There was kind of a benign I, I just I gave her the phrase kind of a benign interest and she said yes yes that's it just kind of a benign interest and I told her I've heard um, analogies like people saying that when they're out of their body their body is kind of like if they'd taken off a, a dear old coat and thought you know you really have done me a nice service and now it's time for goodwill so um, that's the kind of sense that people have uh, they typically recognize their body sooner or later, sometimes not immediately. Um, one, one person, I, I always have her image in mind because she said she left her body and she looked down on this body and she thought, boy, that person down there looks like they're in really bad shape. You know, gosh, that poor person. And then she went, no, wait a minute, that's me. No, this is me. I must be dead. And it's that realization that is not frightening because the person feels perfectly alive. Okay. Um, 
we talked a little bit, bit about the trans, physical, perceptual, and mental capabilities. Um, other things that happen in the out-of-body state is that um, typically if the person <laughs> thinks about something, they immediately manifest it. So, uh, and people don't always just stay around where their physical body is, like the person might think, um, I'm dead, oh gosh, you know, I, I wonder how my mother is, and then zoom, they're there wherever their mother is. And there have been some cases of people having verified what they perceived going on at a, like a distant city while they were cl like clinically dead. So um, uh, the person doesn't necessarily just stay in the vicinity of their physical body. And um, typically then, uh, this is, that first part is what I call the material phase because the person is perceiving the material world, this, this material world. Then there's typically a transition in which the person um, either finds themselves in or moves through like a tunnel or a void and then um, emerges into a transmaterial domain where they encounter um, non-material environments like beautiful fields as you'll, you'll hear Tricia talk about and um, or um, and or they meet deceased loved ones or spiritual entities, sometimes recognized, sometimes not. And um, um, there's one other thing I wanted to tell you about that. It'll, it'll probably come back to me later. Um, if the person about, you know, there's, NDEs have become sort of cartoonized in the in the media and um, you, you know it's like you die and then you you know pop out of your body and you go through a tunnel into a light and actually the tunnel is experienced by um, 30 to 40 percent of near-death experiencers and the um, and light is a very common feature but it doesn't always take the form of a light at the end of the tunnel for example, there's a famous near-death experience of a woman um, who was uh, monitored in, and in, um, she was deeply anesthetized at the time that her NDE occurred. And in her experience, she emerged into this space that, had, that was just lit in this very ethereal, beautiful way. And there was a spiritual entity with her that I don't think she identified. And um, she asked this entity, is this light God? Because it felt absolutely knowing and loving. If you can imagine just a light that pervades everything being knowing and loving. And the spiritual entity said, um, no, th that's not, uh, the light isn't God. The light is what happens when God breathes. And she thought, I'm standing in the breath of God. Really a, a um, kind of amazing uh, thought. Um, oh, and I forgot to t get to the main point, which is that um, if the person does, uh, typically, um, if the person moves through a space toward a light and enters the light and experiences the light as a being um, that is all-knowing and all-loving, it's typically there that the person has a life review. And here the person both reviews and re-experiences typically every moment of their life. And not only that, but also experiences being on the receiving end of their actions. So imagine reviewing, re-experiencing, and perceiving from the side, from the um, perspective of the receiver of your actions every moment of your life. Now people typically say that, um, you know, most of that goes fine, but there are inevitably moments in their lives where they really hurt another person. And um, what they say is that this, if this ha life review happens in the presence of, like, the light, that the light is not at all judgmental. If, um, the light is consistently loving and accepting, but the person themselves feels very um, um, remorseful because they know what they did. They, they actually felt what it was to be on the receiving end of their actions. And probably when we get to talking about after effects, 
this experience more than any other affects people afterwards because they come back, they're resuscitated, they recover, they go on with their lives, and then in every interaction they have in the back of their mind that they're going to relive this. And so it influences the choices they make in the future. Um, and particularly to jump ahead a little bit, um, what near-death experiencers believe, uh, come back from NDEs believing the purpose of life is, is to advance in our capacity to love one another and to acquire knowledge. So in a nutshell, it's loving and learning. So that when people are making these um, choices about how they interact with others from moment to moment, they tend to be guided by the intention to be as loving as possible, which of course is challenging at times. <laughs> so um, here's Trisha. You're going to hear her uh, talk quite a bit about her NDE and its after effects. I interviewed her in 2008, and she was at the time in her mid-30s. She was and still is a community college English teacher here in the DFW area. And uh, she is fully physically functional. You'd never know, looking at her today, that she went through what she went through. But what she went through was that, um, well, first of all, she grew up in an evangelical church, and she said that she pretended to um, like go along with the, the beliefs of the church. Uh, it was her social um, milieu, and she just um, did what she had to to kind of get along. And she, it was fine. She didn't object to it, but she didn't really believe, um, believe it either. She certainly was not like a dedicated um, church member. Um, in 1994, which of course was 14 years before the interview, uh, she was 21 years old. She was a college student at UT Austin. And uh, she was unclear about what she would do with her life. She knew she was good in English. She had the vague thought that maybe after college she'd become like a copy editor. She, she really didn't know. And um, she described herself as um, very self-centered. That's, that's her word, not mine. And you'll actually hear her refer to that um, in part of her uh, talk. Um, one morning she got up early to run a 10K. She doesn't remember the accident. She thinks that she probably fell asleep at the wheel because she knew she was sleepy and she didn't have time to stop and get coffee. And uh, the next thing she knew, she was regaining consciousness after the accident. And um, she had, her back was broken in three places. She had multiple breaks below the waist. Uh, she, the, it kind of like from here down really took a beating um, in her body. She has a couple little scars on her face, but nothing um, hardly even visible. And um, she, the accident happened at 7 in the morning. She went into surgery, I think, at 8 o'clock at night. And um, during the surgery, she did go into cardiac arrest. And um, then, of course, she was resuscitated and recovered, uh, but she spent six months in a full body cast because of the broken back thing. And by the way, when she went into surgery, the um, surgeons, told, the uh, physicians told her that, and her family, that um, it was extremely unlikely that she would ever be able to walk again. So, Let's hear Trisha talk about her NDE. If I can figure out how, oh, there it is. So what's the first thing that you remember from the, once you were anesthetized, I guess? Yeah, I counted back to 98 and then, <laughs> sorry, I remembered those numbers, but then I woke up, as I call it, you know, but I, I left my body and before the monitor said, or, or uh, before the monitor registered that I was dead, I had already left my body. And so I looked down at my body, and then I saw the monitor um, flatline. And then I looked outside of myself, almost afraid on some level, but there were two beings at the end of my bed, and they immediately calmed me because they had, these beings were 
large, like maybe seven, eight feet, and androgynous, not particularly male or female, but the first thing I thought when I saw them is, wow, they are so intelligent. It's, they have a an intelligence that I don't think we have here, and they communicated through their eyes, basically with light, and I was surprised that I continued to go on. I mean, that was like my first real realization was that, okay, outside of my body, I do continue. And I wanted to return and tell other people, hey, we do go on, <laughs> you know, that it was so exciting, you know, that thought that, that we do. But these beings were sending messages to me at a very quick rate of speed. And so I knew that uh, a lot of information was being communicated to me. And how they communicated to me that I would walk and that I would heal is that they sent light, they sent it into my spirit form and said, then watch this. And then they looked at my body and sent light into my body, into the backs of the surgeons, through their hands, into my body. And I just saw the light fill my body and I knew, okay, um, my back would heal, I would walk again, and that everything would be fine. And then they said, continue and so I left the I started leaving the hospital that it felt as if I decided I didn't want to look at my my body anymore at that point you know that it, it uh, the blood and the surgeons and, and so forth it didn't seem like a situation or a scene that I, I wanted to spend time with so I decided I would leave and I started leaving the hospital quickly I left the emergency room, the, the first um, couple of, of doors, and then I went through the waiting room and saw my mom, and then I kept going down the hall and I saw my stepdad. And this is the one situation that makes my near-death experience verifiable. I saw him dropping quarters into a machine and he pulled out a candy bar. And my parents had only been married for a short time. Um, my mom and stepdad and my parents had been divorced for a few years. And um, the I didn't know him very well, but what I knew of him, I knew that he was a health nut and that, you know, both my mom and stepdad never ate candy bars. If they did, you know, it must have been, you know, in secrecy. <laughs> and so I saw him getting this candy bar and I thought, that's strange. And then I continued on and left just flew through the walls of the hospital and then started going into the sky of Austin and you know, looked down at the city and then continued and then the scene changed. It was no longer just Austin or the physical reality where I had been because they started operating at seven at night and the, the, or around eight at night the uh, accident had occurred at seven in the morning. And so it was nighttime, but then at some point it became day. There was a bright light and I was going back in time. So having a small bit of a life review and what I realized or what they, perhaps what the light wanted me to see was that other people who I came in contact with um, had been affected by my presence. And what they wondered is why does this girl stay completely absorbed in herself. Why doesn't she reach out to us? Why doesn't she tell us what's going on in her life? Why is she not more of a friend to us or more open? And so I realized that I had been harming not only myself by not having a connection with other people, but perhaps disappointing other people by not having much of a connection with them. And so I realized that connections with other people make life more meaningful. So that was one of the first lessons. and. Then another lesson, they seem to be crystallized in thoughts. The lessons were not given to me from the light with, with words per se, but they were feelings and then in my own mind I created lines or thoughts that, that seemed to crystallize what the experience was trying to tell me. And one is not to fear death, you know, that there is no fear in death, you know, that it is a beautiful natural experience. And two, that our connections to other people are important and that perhaps even love is all that matters. You know, that the love that you do experience with other people is what makes your life meaningful. And then also, I think many adults, I went back to about the age of five at a time when I loved to play in nature and when I was very connected to the natural world and I didn't have very much stress in my life. And I, I think that another lesson that the light was telling me at that moment was 
people are too stressed out. They don't know how to enjoy themselves, how to play or how to be in nature. So it's important to remind people to enjoy life, you know, to have uh, moments of beauty in their world and in their life. And often that can be found through nature. And then I started getting a little bit closer to the light and it was just an ecstatic, joyful feeling, you know, like, oh, like I'd been there before. I knew it and I knew it in childhood so the closer I got I was probably like four or five at that that moment I knew that if I kept going I wouldn't want to come back and at that moment I felt a wind and these wind this wind there were several different um, elements to the wind but I felt as if it was people's prayers and I, would, I felt it as my grandmother and my mother and different people and I felt this wind encircle my body and start pulling me away from the light and so at the same time, I was five, but I was growing up quickly. It was like I was becoming my older self again. And so the, the wind pulled me back. And as I was leaving, I still saw the green pastures, which are far more green than any green I've seen before, as if it was pure. There was no element to these green pastures that were tainted in any way, as, as was the sky and the world itself, as if, as if maybe a world without pollution, <laughs> perhaps. But, um, but the, uh, as I was coming back, then again I went farther up and I was looking down at this green pasture and there were lots of lights and I saw these lights as students and I knew that um, these would be people that would come into my life and people that I would tell the story to as well. So initially, they would be students and then I just saw all these lights which were represented as spirits and they needed to be reminded of life after death and that that was um, part of my journey was to remind people to perhaps live less selfishly too you know that if I could remind people at that age you know at junior high and high school then perhaps maybe they wouldn't go to college and live the way I lived those those four years that they might um, be thinking a bit more beyond themselves and so that was part of what I felt my purpose was at least at that moment that teaching was definitely tied to my life path and so then I returned to my body and then it happened quickly I think the last thing I remember was really the wind and a lot of movement and it was fast and then things became dark and then I was in my body.